If you have your own home, if you eat full meals and you drink clean water and you have a mobile phone, you can surf the internet and you have gone to professional college or technical college, any kind of school of training, you are in the minuscule, privileged lot in this world. You are among the 7% who are privileged in this life, in this world right now. Is that not something to be thankful for? How easily we can forget how we can forget the benefits of living in this generation. I thought that and considered that if I had been born in another generation because of medical science, I wouldn't be alive today if I had been born in the 19th century. And so we have so much to be grateful for. And though America has imperfections, America is the most wonderful country in the world, bar none. And all you have to do to know that is to live outside the country, and you will appreciate what you have. This, it's always drawing a contrast, and that's why I think it's necessary for our young people to travel after they graduate. The Brits have a gap year. So after they graduate, they spend a year traveling, and very often they'll work as they travel. They'll get to know what the real world is like, and that's a sobering experience, because many academics are living in, in ivory towers, and so they'll have an opportunity to see the world as it really is. And that gap year is very often an opportunity to reassess their lives and to find a goal and a vision and a direction for their life. And that's why I think it's vitally important for our young people to see how other people around the world live. And perhaps they may come back and thank God for this wonderful country and for the blessings that we enjoy each and every day that we don't even think about. How many of you know Dennis Prager? Dennis Prager is Jewish, and he is a very devout Jew. And he has said some very fascinating things, especially as it pertains to gratitude and thankfulness. Dennis Prager says, there is a secret to happiness, and it is gratitude. All happy people are grateful, and ungrateful people cannot be happy. There's truth here. We tend to think that it is being unhappy that leads people to complain, but it is truer to say that it is complaining that leads people to become unhappy. Become grateful, and you will become a much happier person. And he cited how in the Judeo-Christian tradition, and even in our liturgy, in our scriptures, there is an emphasis on thanking God. In fact, he cites the 92nd Psalm, where it begins, it is good to give thanks to the Lord. And the question is, why is it good to give thanks to the Lord? Is it because of God? Does, does God need our gratitude? No, God needs nothing. It's because we need it. Do you see that? We need to be able to thank God. Because as we thank God, we will not take him for granted. We will forget not his benefits. We will be eternally grateful for all he has done. We will be most appreciative, and we will not become self-entitled. Amen? And so the less you take for granted, Prager says, the more pleasure and joy life will bring you. How true that is. There's an author, Margaret Craven, and she wrote in her book, I Heard the Owl Call My Name. She cites a story of a young minister who went to the Kwakiutl Indians or Native Americans or in a, in a remote 
part of British Columbia, Canada. And what was interesting is that he found it very curious that this tribe had no word for thank you. No one would think that would be one of the foundational terms you would have, thank you. And it was really quite confusing to him in the fact that they just, he discovered that one of the most important words, one of the important terms was absent from their vocabulary. How do you express gratitude? And what is fascinating about this is that it was their custom that they would return every favor with a favor in kind. Every actness, act of kindness would be returned with an act of kindness, equal or, or superior. And that's how they treated one another. And the minister that she mentions, Mark Bryan, realized that in this culture of this tribe, you don't say thank you, you do thank you. Do you see that? When you do it, you don't have to say it. If I'm a Christian, I can do it, and I don't have to say it because there are places where I'm not allowed to share my faith. But my faith and your faith will be witnessed by others. Paul says that we're like letters written by Christ, not with pen and ink, but with the Holy Spirit. And so people will read our lives. And we shared with the youth the other day that people will read you before they listen to you. They'll look at your life to see if you're living what you preach and what you believe. And if you are, it lends credibility to your testimony. And that's where people's hearts will be open when they see that we are holy. Holy means other, that we are other, that we're not holding ourselves above others or we're not better than others, but we belong to Jesus. And we reveal our Lord. We reveal the one we love to the world around us. Amen? So we tend, our, our, our nature, our old nature, tends to take things for granted. And in taking things for granted, we don't appreciate them. There's this Jewish story. I grew up in a Jewish community and an Italian community and in an Irish community and a Polish community and a black community and a Hispanic community. And every group has tremendous humor. I, it's, it's, it's amazing. Groups that have suffered a great deal of discrimination, they have amazing senses of humor. And you could see many of the comedians are from ethnic groups. There's an old Jewish story that illustrates this point about perspective and appreciation. There's a man who goes to his rabbi and he complains, life is unbearable. There are nine of us living in one room. What can I do? That even sounds Jewish, right? What can I do? The rabbi answers, take your goat into the room with you. That was obviously after much prayer. The man is absolutely shocked and incredulous, but the rabbi is insistent. Do as I say and come back next week. A week later, the man comes back looking more destroyed than ever before. He tells the rabbi, we cannot stand it. The goat is filthy. And no doubt the goat is smelly as well and noisy. Goats are not exactly quiet animals. The rabbi then tells him, go home and let the goat out and come back next week. The next week, the man comes back. He is radiant. He's filled with joy. He's exclaiming, life is beautiful. We enjoy every minute of it now that there's no goat, only the nine of us. 
You see, the situation was the same as it was at first, but the perception had changed. Amen? Get the goats out of your life and get the goats out of your house and praise God. Amen? So perspective comes through faith and trust in God. Amen? Is the glass half empty or is it half full? I grew up in a very, very negative environment. And it was the nature of the work that my parents did. Because in order to excel at their work, there was a measure of skepticism. There was a measure of questioning everything. And I grew up in this environment. I didn't realize how much it affected me that I was like devoid of hope because I would see everything that can go wrong. When your mother's an insurance broker, I'm just saying, take, the, take your little card out of there. You can trip on that fall, hit your head on the stone over there and break your arm on the tree over there. I'm not, you know, I'm thinking, okay, this is how I'm living my life now. And so you begin to see the glass half empty. And that robs you of joy and peace and hope. Those who are ungrateful, and I became so absorbed in this, in negativism, I was actually ungrateful. I had very little expectations of anything changing in the future, and I was unthankful. I saw the glass half empty. When I saw the glass half empty, I was in a negative frame of mind, so I didn't expect anything. You see, the half empty are the negatives. They are those who do not enjoy their drink because they have little expectation of a refill. Do you see that? They have little expectation of a refill. The half empties, of which I was numbered among, now I am not, praise God, the half empties have little gratitude and therefore lack enthusiasm and fervency or motivation. Amen? David was not a half empty. He said, my cup runneth over. It runneth over. Paul understood that and likened his life to a cup that was being filled as it was being poured out into the lives of others. It was being filled and poured out and filled and poured out until the last measure was poured out at the end of his life. Life is about being filled, but you must be poured out to be filled. Amen? Gratitude is good for you physically, emotionally, and spiritually. It is good for your health. Science tells us, and these are scientific studies, these are valid studies that have been taken and, and made throughout the years. Being thankful is strongly linked with both, both mental and physical health, and it can help to relieve stress, depression, and addictions. This is demonst demonstrable. If you do not behave graciously, that is with gratitude, we see that ingratitude can cause relational problems which could deny us the social support that we need in times of distress and depression and discouragement because we're pushing people away. Ingratitude pushes people away. Gratitude draws them to you because you have opened their hearts. You want to bless somebody? Thank them for the good they've done. People want to be appreciated. People want to be valued. People want validation. People want to know, how am I doing? I can't tell you how important that is. There was a fellow who wrote that 
among his workers? Gratitude, his expression of gratitude as a boss was almost as important as compensation, as financial compensation to the workers. It boosted the morale of his staff and his workers. It lifted their spirits. It gave them hope. It gave them a sense of community and unity and common purpose. No one ever gets anything out of people by beating them down. Right? I mean, if I were a chronic complainer, would you really want to hang around me? Now, people have things that concern them and that they will express those concerns. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about chronic complaining. There are two kinds of people, and we use this kitchen metaphor numerous times, but it is valid. There are two kinds of people. There are drains and there are faucets. You can be a faucet, which means that you will pour into the lives of other people rather than drain them and deplete them and extinguish any hope or motivation in them. But remember one thing, when you pour into people's lives, they must pour into the lives of others. Amen? We pay it forward. Numerous studies now link gratitude to health. There was a study of a thousand Swiss adults ranging from teenagers to people in their 80s. They were studied. And it was found that physical health, I mean, that's a huge uh, spectrum of, of age groups. It was found that physical health was strongly linked with gratitude, basically because it improved psychological health. They were healthy emotionally, and no doubt healthy spiritually if you pray. And you, the Bible says that we are to offer prayer with thanksgiving. Prayer and petition with thanksgiving. We are to offer to God. And the peace of God will rule our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So as we pray and as we thank God, we have peace. That brings emotional stability and spiritual stability and maturity. Does this make sense? I'm here. We're all here to encourage one another, to equip each other, and to sow into one another's lives. I have things to learn from you, you have things to learn from me, and you have things to learn from one another. This is the beauty of the church, which is called the body of Christ. Paul says we belong to one another. Amen? Just as my hand belongs to my body and my foot belongs to my body, everyone has a specific gift an ability that is God-given, that is necessary for the functioning of the body of Christ, the church. Amen? And so, better psychological or, or emotional health meant that people were more likely to engage in health-promoting activities. They would be more health-conscious. And this kept people in a better mental and physical condition than if they engaged in negative, self-destructive behaviors. Religious thankfulness or gratitude toward God can actually predict a susceptibility to mental illness. It's actually predictive that if you are a person, if you are a believer who is thankful and grateful to God and expressing that to God and to others, that is a predictor of emotional and mental illness. And it bears witness to the fact that if you are grateful and thankful toward God and others, you will have a greater sense 
of emotional stability and peace in your life. Amen? Those who were most spiritually thankful had a lower risk of depression, studies indicate. They had a lower risk of generalized anxiety, phobias, bulimia, addictions, including alcohol, nicotine, and illegal drugs. Tell me thankfulness and gratitude is not vital. The scripture says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be made new in the attitude of your mind. Your attitude determines your altitude with God. And your attitude can change the atmosphere and the environment in which you live, in which you worship, and in which you work. Amen? Praise God. I, that's why I thank God for believers in the workplace. This is your mission field. Where there's negativism and there's conflict and strife, blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. And you are peacemakers. The world needs you. The world needs the love of Jesus in you. They need your gentleness, your care, your kindness, your goodness, your wisdom. You bring stability in an unstable world. You bring light and life in a place that is dark and filled with hopelessness and despair. And that's the world we live in today. Amen? Being thankful has a strong relationship to one's health. Studies also show that interventions to increase gratitude will help people who are anxious. So if you, in, if you intervene in another person's life and encourage them, encourage them to be grateful, set an example by up by speaking life to them. You see, one who is grateful is one who is expressing that every promise of God is yes and amen. I knew how to say no. In, I was multilingual. Did you know that? I know how to say no in about nine different languages because I grew up that way. But only now I'm trying to learn to say yes in nine different languages. Amen. Praise God. There's hope for us all. Amen. Amen. What is interesting is the key to reaping all of the benefits of thankfulness seems to involve what people thought about as they tried to fall asleep. Isn't that interesting? You see, grateful people who were focusing on the positive would sleep well. Those who were ungrateful and were consumed by worries and fears would not sleep well, and it ultimately would affect their well-being, their health, and their energy levels. Isn't it amazing? The most common ways to improve one's gratitude and thankfulness, experts say, is to make a list of the things that you are grateful for each and every day. Journal it. Put it before you. Open the book every now and then and say, Lord, you rescued me from this, from this terrible trial and trouble. You rescued me from this person. You rescued me from this attack. Lord, you've been with me. There you have a chronicle of the work of God in your life. Isn't that wonderful? That's the way you overcome. That's the way you maintain an attitude of gratitude. And this is biblical. We forget not the Lord's benefits. And we think on good things. Adults and adolescents who feel grateful have more energy and optimism, more social connection, and more happiness than those who do not, according to studies. And there's also less likelihood of depression, envy, and even alcoholism. 
Grateful students reported higher grades, more life satisfaction, better social integration, and less envy and depression than their peers who were less grateful and thankful and more materialistic. Those who were grateful were less materialistic. Moreover, feelings of gratitude had a more powerful impact on the students' lives overall. Research suggests that gratitude should be continuing in order to make a lasting difference in well-being. In other words, thanksgiving should be a lifestyle of thanks living. And you will reap the dividends. In order to reap all of its benefits, feeling gratitude, having gratitude, expressing gratitude must be ingrained into your personality, experts say, and you must frequently acknowledge and be thankful for the role that other people play in your life and in your happiness. So we thank God and we thank others. And this should be ingrained in our children. My parents ingrained that in me. My parents would not say to me, Paul, go fix your bed. They'd say, Paul, please fix your bed. Make your bed, tidy up your room, please. If I didn't do that, they would be firm with me. There could be consequences for not tidying up my room. But they taught me respect by respecting me. And I respected them. They taught me to say please and thank you. They taught me that in this world, nobody owes me anything. And when I came to God, I understood that God owes me nothing and I owe him everything. Amen? Amen? I owe him everything. He owes me nothing. And so by God's grace, I had parents who taught me in such a way that I did not grow up self-entitled. I did not grow up demanding. And so the researchers are correct. We must instill an attitude of gratitude in our children at the most tender of years. Amen. What is fascinating is that studies show that using negative or derogatory words are extremely harmful. When you think of the person you communicate with most in your life, in your everyday activities, who is it? Who are you talking to most each and every day? We might think, oh, my husband, my wife, my father, my mother, my sister, my brother, my son, my daughter. No. Do you know who you're talking to most each and every day? Yourself. And some of you are speaking negative junk into your lives. You are dragging yourself down. You have a low opinion of yourself, and the evil one is reinforcing that to beat you up and to beat you into submission where you have no hope. Because faith is being sure of what you hope for. And that's why the enemy wants to rid you of any hope. So the person you speak to most frequently is yourself. And you must be careful and choose the words carefully when you have this monologue with yourself. Because even as you talk to yourself, derogatory and negative words can darken your mood and drag you into an abyss of discouragement, disillusionment, and hopelessness and despair. So watch what you speak to yourself. Speak the word of God. That's why get it in your heart. Meditate on, it, on the word of God means murmuring it pondering it, turning it over. It pictures a cow chewing on the cud. Day in, day out, moment by moment, the cow is chewing and chewing on his, on his food over and over and over again. That's how the Word of God 
should be in our hearts. Fill your mind with positive thoughts. Express, and express gratitude and encouragement aloud. Look for things in your life that you are thankful for and highlight them. Thanksgiving is not some sporadic thing or a momentary thing. <clears throat> it is a consistent lifestyle. Remember, Israel had witnessed these amazing miracles by God. Miracles that they even celebrate today on the Passover. But how Israel at the time suffered spiritual amnesia and they forgot the benefits of the Lord, the breakthroughs of the Lord, the miracles of the Lord. And what did they do? They were not grateful. And they delved into sinful behavior and rebellion. And they took the precious gold that the Lord allowed them to take from Egypt and they fashioned a calf that they worshipped. That's a picture of America today. We worship the work of our hands. We worship material things instead of the one who's created all things. Amen? And there's a message for Israel and a message for us. Paul says in Philippians 2, do everything without complaining or argue, arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out what? The word of life. If the word of life is in here, Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth will speak. And if the word is here, you will not complain. You will thank. You will be grateful. You will express it to God and to others. And that will contrast you with the world around you. And that will allow you and enable you to shine. You'll be like stars shining in the universe. And the people in the world need the illumination that comes from the light of life, Jesus Christ, who is revealed in and through your life. Does this make sense? Praise God. Of all, there were Samaritans and there were lepers. And there was only one that came back. The nine didn't come back to give thanks. It's believed when Jesus said to the lepers, he said one of them, when he saw he was healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice. Now, this was a Samaritan. This was an embarrassment to the Jews of the time because they had the word of God. And the Samaritans were not believers. The Jews despised the Samaritans. They were not Jews. They were not fulfilling the law of Yahweh, the law of Moses. And so he threw himself in praise. He was praising God. He came back praising God in a loud voice to thank Jesus. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all the ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. One translation says, Your faith has healed you. And there are those who believe that Jesus was actually referring to this man who came back, who was referring to salvation. The one who comes back with gratitude. When you come back with gratitude. Whenever your life is drifting from God, if you don't know Jesus and you come to him, he will save you. You repent and you offer your life to Jesus and you will be saved. Amen. Amen. Our word, think and thank, have a common root. It's an old Anglo-Saxon word. And so thankfulness is actually thinkfulness in that generation, many, many hundreds of years ago. And so a thinking man will think about and meditate on the Lord 
and who he is and his goodness, his grace and his mercy. And a thinking man will be a thankful man because what will rise up in knowing who God is is appreciation, is gratitude and thankfulness to God for his goodness. His love is from everlasting to everlasting. And so is his faithfulness. So right thinking yields thanksgiving. Paul says in Philippians 4, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, whatever is admirable, anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And that is one of our most vulnerable points. I'm sharing with you today that gratitude and thankfulness are powerful keys to the kingdom of heaven. If you want to enjoy the blessings of the kingdom of God, you come with thanksgiving and with praise. Amen? In fact, Paul says, be joyful always in 1 Thessalonians 5. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Sometimes, sometimes you're thanking God when there are tears in your eyes, when you're grieving, when you're hurting, when you're suffering, when you're at the end of yourself. It's a sacrifice of praise. It's a sacrifice of praise. It's not easy. But God's Spirit living in you will empower you to praise and to thank in the midst of the storms. Because in the midst of your storms, Jesus is in the boat. And that's something to be thankful for. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's read this great scripture. Psalm 100. This is how you thank God. We'll close with this. Psalm 100, verse 1. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. In other words, express joyfully your love and your gratitude for God. It must be expressed. It must be open. It must be outwardly revealed. The second is verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with joy. It's not through obligation that we serve God. Oh, I've got to go to church. Oh, I've got to worship God. Oh, my, I've got to pray. I haven't cracked the Bible. I've got to open up the Bible. That is not worshiping God in spirit and in truth. It is not approaching God with a desire to know him, to delve into his words for inspiration, for instruction, for life, for direction. That's not the attitude. Be joyful always, pray continuously, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And then he says here, in verse 19, do not put out the Spirit's fire. When I'm negative, when I complain, when I'm unjoyful, when I'm ungrateful, when I'm self-entitled, friends, I put out the Spirit's fire in my life. Do you see that? Do you see how important it is to be joyful and to be thankful? So he says, joyful shout unto the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. This originates in the heart. It's expressed through your speaking and your singing. It's filling you from the inside out. It always begins on the inside. God works in you to will and act according to his good purposes. Outwardly, I'm wasting away. Inwardly, I'm being transformed. And this is how you grow. God is teaching you through circumstances that are difficult, through hardship and adversity. God is teaching you to depend on him. And when you depend on him, you see his power and his glory and his might and his divine 
purpose is being fulfilled in your life right before your very eyes. Then that is knowing Jesus. There are many people who know about Jesus. They even have some scriptures memorized, but it's here and it's not experiential. The whole purpose of knowing the word of God and taking it into my heart is that it is living and active and it must be living and active in me if it's going to bear fruit. In fact, the scripture says that, that the scriptures were of no benefit to them because they didn't mix it with faith. And they allowed the worries and the cares of this world to choke out the word that was within them, making it unfruitful. Do you see that? And so God is teaching you some valuable things, giving you tools that are going to serve you and your children and your family in your future. And it doesn't matter what happens in the world. You are going to be equipped. It doesn't matter how severe the battles will be. If you are a member of the military, they train you for the most severe battles. So it doesn't matter about the intensity. It matters about your preparation your preparedness, your discipline, your willingness to take orders, your willingness to do what, you, what God tells you to do as a soldier of the Lord. And then he says, know that the Lord is, he is God. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So joyfully shout, serve, come, come to God. Be with him, spend time with him. Know the Lord, because when you come to him, you will know the Lord. When you spend time with him and you talk to him, even throughout the day, relationship is a, is a two-way street. When you talk to God, he's going to whisper into your heart. And then enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. You won't even get past the gates if you don't come with gratitude in your heart. Are you getting this? And praise is declaring who he is, that he is your God, and that there's nothing impossible with him. It's declaring the wonderful, the awesome, and the mighty things he has done. Amen? And then it says, Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. God's truth endures to all generations, and you as a parent have the power and the responsibility and the divine authority to sow the seeds of God's truth into the hearts of your children. Amen. And God is faithful. Let us come before him, Psalm 95, with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Amen? Shall we stand? Any parent knows that a child that is grateful a child who wants to be with mommy and daddy. A child who expresses his or her love for mom and dad and what they do. Who appreciates them. They're a delight to their parents. They're a joy to their parents. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And that can be understood as God's joy in you as his child. You see, you bring him delight and joy. God has joy. And the joy of the Lord is your strength. You give him joy and he gives you strength. Do you see that? Let him do that. If this has touched your heart in any way, you're welcome to come to the altar because God is transforming lives today. Amen? God receives you at salvation just the way you are, but he never leaves you that way. He conforms you to the image and the likeness of Jesus.